Today, we're going to look at Sigmund Freud's 1919 article, The Uncanny, and Masahiro Mori's article from 1970, The Uncanny Valley. We'll start with Freud. Last time, we talked about Ernst Gentsch's ideas about the uncanny, a feeling of unease that something isn't familiar, doesn't quite fit, isn't quite right. Freud is looking to dig deeper into the idea, though that means things will get Freudian. Certainly, Freud says, the uncanny, unheimlich, belongs to the realm of the frightening, of what evokes fear and dread. But, he says, the term is not always used in a clear way. Commonly, the term is used as a general term for that which arouses fear. In psychology, it seems, only Gensch has so far investigated the subject. Freud says, Gensch stresses, as one of the difficulties attendant upon the study of the uncanny, the fact that people differ greatly in their sensitivity to this kind of feeling. So, some people are more sensitive to the uncanny, some people are less sensitive, and Freud admits that he's rarely overcome with the feeling of the uncanny, which raises the question of why he's writing an article about it. He says, as an aesthetic matter, depending in part on the sensitivity of subjects, the uncanny is not unusual, it's like any number of other aesthetic responses. So in general, Freud says, the uncanny is that species of the frightening that goes back to what was once well known and had long been familiar. But this is going to take some cashing out. The German, he says, on Heimlich, the unfamiliar, is the opposite of Heimlich, the familiar. While it seems obvious that something may be frightening because it's unfamiliar, we fear the unknown. What's unfamiliar, he says, is not necessarily frightening. Now, Gensch doesn't go beyond relating the uncanny to the unfamiliar. Freud says, for him, the essential condition for the emergence of a sense of the uncanny is intellectual uncertainty, being unsure. But, it seems, there's more to be plumbed in the uncanny than it's being equated with mere intellectual uncertainty. So, Freud embarks on an exhaustive etymological analysis, looking at the meaning of the word. Now, since we're dealing with this in translation, that might raise some issues. Freud notes first that looking to other languages won't work, as there doesn't seem to be an equivalent term to unheimlich, the uncanny, in many languages. So, Freud starts with definitions of Heimlich, and the first German dictionary definition that he offers is belonging to the house, not strange, familiar, tame, dear and intimate, homely, etc. A better word we might use instead of homely is homey, meaning like the home, comfortable. Homely is the word that the British would use, so surely we had a British translator. We also get a definition focused on the affect, the feeling. Intimate, cozily homely, arousing a pleasant feeling of quiet contentment, etc., of comfortable repose and secure protection, like the enclosed comfortable house. So he says this term is also used in reference to tame animals, those things that are familiar with humans that aren't wild. But Freud finds another curious dictionary definition of Heimlich. Concealed kept hidden so that others do not get to know of it or about it, and it's hidden from them. So what we have between these three definitions are seemingly opposite definitions of Heimlich. Two of these emphasize that which is familiar and comfortable, and the other what's concealed and kept hidden. From the philosopher Friedrich Schelling, we get the term uncanny on Heimlich, applies to everything that was intended to remain secret, hidden away, and has come out into the open. Gensch singles out the case of doubt as to whether an apparently animate object really is alive, and conversely, whether a lifeless object might not perhaps be animate. So he talks about wax figures and dolls, automata, 
like Chuck E. Cheese, people undergoing epileptic seizures. He says, in storytelling, the uncanny effect might be brought about by leaving the reader uncertain as to whether some figure is a real person or an automaton. Gench pointed in particular at E.T.A. Hoffman, and Freud looks in particular at Hoffman's story, The Sandman, which we've read. So the story includes a seemingly animate doll, Olympia, though this doesn't seem to be the only or even central factor responsible for the uncanny effect, Freud argues. Rather, Freud says, the central motif with regard to the uncanny is the Sandman himself who tears out the eyes of children. And the author lets us doubt whether Capellius is the Sandman, as little Nathaniel suspects, or if this is just delirium. But, Freud says, in Hoffman's tale, the sense of the uncanny attaches directly to the figure of the Sandman, and therefore to the idea of being robbed of one's eyes. And intellectual uncertainty, as Gensch understands it, has nothing to do with this effect. Uncertainty as to whether an object is animate or inanimate, which we were bound to acknowledge in the case of the doll Olympia, is, he says, quite irrelevant to the case of this more potent example of the uncanny. Children don't fear their dolls coming to life. In fact, they might well wish it. However, the fear of losing one's eyes is, as the study of dreams and myth teaches us, Freud says, often a substitute for the fear of castration. Now, well, there it is. Freud managed to get 17 pages into his essay before bringing up castration. Now, if you were not convinced of this connection, he says, then why is this fear for the eyes so closely linked here with the death of the father? Why does the Sandman always appear as a disruptor of love? These and many other features of the tale appear arbitrary and meaningless if one rejects the relation between fear for the eyes and fear of castration. But they become meaningful as soon as the Sandman is replaced by the dreaded father at whose hands castration is expected, at least on Freud's view. In another of Hoffman's stories, The Devil's Elixirs, Freud says, the most prominent motif producing the uncanny effect is the idea of the double. The doppelganger, including where one's identity blurs with that of another through the sharing of thoughts. He says we similarly find the concept of the double in psychoanalysis, that branch of psychology that Freud founded, in the splitting of the superego from the ego. The ego serves as the realistic moderator of the id's impulsive desires. The id acts according to the pleasure principle. The id just wants and wants. The ego operates according to the reality principle. It asks, what's a realistic thing? What's the best thing? The superego, he says, represents the internalization of cultural rules. It's our conscience. The superego's authority is a sort of double of the ego that splits off in a primitive phase of mental development. The sense of the uncanny, Freud says, a feeling of hopelessness, can arise in several situations. He says one may, for instance, have lost one's way in the woods, perhaps after being overtaken by fog, and despite all of one's efforts to find a marked or familiar path, one comes back again and again to the same spot which one recognizes by a particular physical feature. On that note, let's watch another clip from the Blair Witch Project. No, that's the tree we crossed. That tree is down. That's the same one. Oh, God! No. Oh, no. You've got to be kidding me! This is a joke! No. This is not funny! Moses, please, please stop. Please, please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Oh, no. no. No, Mike, it's not the same log. It's not the same log, Mike. Same log. Look, it's not. It is. Open your eyes. It's not the same log. It's not, it's not the same log. <laughs> Okay. It's 
okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Where, where do you want to go to camp? I mean, I guess today south didn't work out, so tomorrow we'll go east. I don't, I don't know what to say, Josh. We walked south all day, okay? We walked south all fucking day. I don't know how we ended up here. They walked south all day and somehow ended up going in a circle. The familiar, Freud would say, has magically become unfamiliar. And that's uncanny. That's creepy. That's scary. Freud says one of the uncanniest superstitions is fear of what's called the evil eye. At base, a fear that another's malevolent thoughts might have causal efficacy. The idea that somebody could wish evil upon you simply by force of will. Freud calls this the omnipotence of thought. This, he says, is a throwback to animistic views of the universe, the ways we used to believe how things worked, sort of magical thinking about the world. And he says, we each seem to go through a stage of development individually that mirrors this primitive stage in human development. When we're children, we believe these things are possible, but then we move beyond that belief. Freud says, everything we now find uncanny meets the criterion that it is linked with these remnants of animistic mental activity and prompts them to express themselves. Psychoanalytic theory, the view that talk therapy helps to bring these repressed ideas to the surface and allow us to deal with them, says that every affect arising from an emotional impulse, every feeling arising from a desire of whatever kind is converted into fear by being repressed. When we shove it away, that produces a fear. And in the uncanny, the frightening element has been suppressed, shoved away, but it comes back. And here we can see what's going on with that switching in meaning between the familiar, Heimlich, and its opposite, the uncanny. Freud says, for this uncanny element is actually nothing new or strange, but something that was long familiar to the psyche and was estranged from it only through being repressed. The link with repression now illuminates Schelling's definition of the uncanny as something that should have remained hidden and has come into the open. It's something that we did feel, we did believe, but we shoved it away. It becomes uncanny when it comes back. So with epilepsy, Freud says, the layman sees a manifestation of forces that he did not suspect in a fellow human being, because the layman is not a neurologist, but whose stirrings he can dimly perceive in remote corners of his own personality. He could feel this happening within himself. It's been shoved away. He could imagine it coming back. Freud suggests that the feeling of the uncanny associated with any severed body part displaying independent animation, whether it's a severed head or a severed hand or feet moving by themselves, stems from proximity to the castration complex. Let's take a look at a scene from Evil Dead 2. Here's your new home.
I think Freud would love Evil Dead too. That was Ash's hand. This is Ash, but it's been removed in the scene we're going to see in a later class, and now it's become evil. It's out to get him. The uncanny fear of being buried alive, Freud says, would seem to derive from the fantasy of living in the womb. He says, an uncanny effect often arises when the boundary between fantasy, what we want to return to the womb, and reality is blurred. So I thought we could take a look at a scene from Wes Craven's film, The Serpent and the Rainbow, that we mentioned a few classes back. I'm going to have to rewatch the whole thing soon. Although everything uncanny, Freud says, appears to be something that was repressed and which now reappears, the inverse is not true. He says, not everything that reminds us of repressed desires or of superannuated modes of thought belonging to the prehistory of the individual and the race, things that we used to believe individually or collectively and that we no longer do, is, for that reason, uncanny. So, not every severed hand in fiction will produce the uncanny effect. It's not always going to be scary. Meat prices are sky high, and I'm trying to keep my food budget down to earth. Hi, I can help. The helping hand from Hamburger Helper. Nor do all-powerful wishes and animate cutlery and furniture in fairy tales produce the uncanny effect. Be our guest. Be our guest. Put our service to the test. Tie your napkin round your neck, sherry, and we provide the rest. Soup du jour, hot hors d'oeuvre, why, we only live to serve. Try the gray stuff, it's delicious. Don't believe me? Ask the dishes. They can sing, they can dance. After all, miss, this is France. So when the dishes and the furniture start dancing and singing in a Disney movie, it's not scary. It's a fairy tale. Nor, Freud says, can we so easily dismiss the element of intellectual uncertainty that Jench talked about. That does seem to be a piece of the puzzle. He says, in the case of omnipotent thoughts, like the evil eye, and the dead returning, like zombies, our primitive ancestors once believed these as real possibilities. We today, he says, have surmounted these beliefs, but we're not truly secure in our new beliefs. They're always on the shelf waiting to be pulled down again. Now, Freud says, as soon as something happens in our lives that seems to confirm these old discarded beliefs that are still up there on the shelf, we experience a sense of the uncanny. Now, someone who has truly rejected such animistic beliefs feels no uncanny effect in these circumstances because there's nothing to draw from the subconscious. The rest of us are going to feel a little creepy because we never really did away with the belief. Now, where the uncanny stems from a childhood complex, he says, like the castration complex or womb fantasy, what's at issue is not a question of what's real, but rather what's been repressed. So, desires are repressed, and primitive beliefs are surmounted. We move past them. The former deal with what we want, the latter deal with what is real. When it comes to the uncanny in fiction, we deal with the imagination, which puts aside the question of what's real, so things get a little more complicated. Freud says, The apparently paradoxical upshot of this is that many things that would be uncanny if they occurred in real life are not uncanny in literature, and that in literature there are many opportunities to achieve uncanny effects 
that are absent in real life. With the work of fiction, he says, we accept the author's choice about how close the fiction matches our own world. In that world, wish fulfillment or the omnipotence of thoughts, animated furniture may well be the norm, and so they'll produce no uncanny effect in the reader. So, fairy tales don't produce the uncanny effect because fairy tales take place in worlds with dancing furniture. However, where the author presents the story in what he calls common reality, our world, what would produce the uncanny effect in real life does the same thing here. And fiction allows the author further opportunities to promote the effect. In a sense, then, the author betrays us to a superstition we thought we had surmounted. He tricks us by promising us everyday reality and then going beyond it, pulling back on these beliefs that we thought we had surmounted, that we had shoved away. Where the uncanny arises from repressed complexes, this is strong in both literature and in real life. When the uncanny arises from what he was calling superannuated modes of thought, primitive beliefs that we've surmounted, it'll operate in real life and in those fictions that are grounded in material reality, that look like our world where that's been promised to us. From Freud's classic essay, we move on to Masahiro Mori's classic article, The Uncanny Valley, from 1970. Mori, there he is, with a purple thing behind his head, bad positioning for a photograph, says, as a thing approaches resemblance to the human form, it becomes more and more familiar, and so more and more comfortable. But there's a point where it looks quite human, but not quite human enough. And this produces a sense of strangeness, what we've been calling the uncanny. Mori is a roboticist, and he plots a chart according to which the closer something comes to the appearance of a healthy human being, the more familiar and thus comfortable the thing is. He says that adding movement to something, like a robot, where movement is a sign of life, exaggerates the peaks and valleys that we're going to investigate. So let's start with an industrial robot. An industrial robot is at the start of the graph. It does a job, it behaves in a loose sense in a sort of way, but it doesn't in any way resemble an ordinary human. So the industrial robot might not produce, you know, comfortable feelings of familiarity, but it's not disturbing either. It's, it's a machine. If we move further up the chart, closer towards the healthy person, we find a humanoid robot. So robotics is moving more and more towards something that resembles a healthy person, and it's sort of got a comfortable feel for it. Now, Mori says, while the goal of robotics and prosthetics is to create something that perfectly mimics the human form, there's a danger. There's a point when the thing gets close to human appearance, but not close enough. And here, it's strange and unfamiliar. It's creepy. This is the uncanny valley, and a thing that gets close, but not close enough to the appearance of a healthy person tumbles in. With an industrial robot, we expect movement, and the machine doesn't resemble a human, so it's not familiar, but it's not uncomfortable. He says, if we add movement to a prosthetic hand, which is already at the bottom of the uncanny valley, our sensation of strangeness grows quite large. We then move the thumb to this position and we can get a tripod grip. So picking what small things up. 
we can then change the grip again. And this is power grip, this is for heavy things. This is for shaking hands, this is for being human. Then we have this grip here. This is one that scares children and upsets my wife. Right, take the hand here. This is trigger grip, but it can be adapted. Now, why would that upset his wife? Why would that scare children? Maury says, if a mannequin started to move, you might be shocked. This is a kind of horror. It's a thing that looks an awful lot like a human appendage, but not quite close enough, and so it tumbles into the uncanny valley. Maury says, if we cut the speed in half, laughing looks unnatural. This illustrates how slight variations in movement can cause a robot or a puppet or a prosthetic hand to tumble down into the uncanny valley. Down at the bottom of the still line, we find the corpse. It very closely resembles a human being. It's just, well, not moving. And so it's creepy. Way down at the bottom of the moving line, we find the zombie, which resembles a corpse, doesn't quite resemble a healthy person, and so it's especially creepy. Moving up the far side of the uncanny valley, we find what are called Bunraku puppets. <laughs> The Bunraku puppet has very human-like movements, but it's still in the uncanny valley, though it's starting to work its way upside the outer edge. So it's still going to be somewhat unsettling. Mori says, robotics designers should aim for the first peak, the close side of the valley, rather than the second peak. The second peak is higher, which means it's going to be more comfortable and more familiar, but we also have a higher danger of falling into the uncanny valley. All right, let's look at one last example of robotics, and you can tell me where you think it falls. IAST has developed a male version of its Android robot Actroid F, which was first shown to the public last year. These human-like robots imitate the movements of the people they are watching and are currently being placed as observers in hospitals to see how patients feel in their presence. Would you like one of these in your hospital room when you wake up from surgery? How comfortable would you be in their presence?